Servus, hello and grüzi. Matthias Eichler here and this, this is Single Track and I am so stoked to share with you my conversation with no other than the second place finisher of the 2023 UTMB women's race, Katharina Hartmut. Calling in from beautiful Zurich, Switzerland. I tell you, this UTMB week was everything. I loved every moment of it and I hope you did too. Following it along from afar, watching online, being glued to the screen. Ugh, fantastic. And I wasn't even in Chamonix. We were witness to incredible displays of grit and a wonderful celebration of the human spirit. I'm so inspired and love being part of this crazy thing called trail running. Well, enough from me. Let's get into the show. Katharina Hartmut, you're on single track. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for the invitation. Yes. So, number one, I mean, I need to start, obviously, with congratulating you. Second place, UTMB, just like last few days. What an incredible performance. Congrats. Thank you very much. I still can't believe it by myself. <laughs> I know. I, I thought perhaps I'll give you a few days to let it sink in. So perhaps like the leg pain will start to disappear and you can start thinking about something else. But it's still very, very fresh, isn't it? It is definitely. So finally, I feel better. I actually feel quite uh, well recovered, which is super nice. Um, but yeah, like emotionally and mentally, I'm somehow still stuck on the trails. <laughs> I I can I can imagine it. So what we're going to do is we're going to be very evil now. And rather than talk about UTMB that everybody wants to hear about, let's quickly introduce you on a little bit larger scale to the audience. You live in Zurich right now, but that's not your home base. Where are you from originally? So I was born in Western Germany, um, but then I was like living most of my life in uh, Leipzig, which is more in the eastern part of Germany. Went to school there. And then actually I moved to Switzerland like nine years ago um, for my studies. Yeah. And All since right. then I'm basically living here in Zurich. Okay, okay, perfect. Full-time student? No, you're not full-time student. But you're, just, you're obviously training. How do you balance your studies and what are you studying? Um, so I've studied earth sciences um, as like a base studies and then I went on to study atmospheric and climate science and then I did my PhD um, also in atmospheric and climate science and I just finished my PhD in June this year and uh, now after the PhD I will uh, stay at the university um, and do a postdoc so that's what uh, I do. That's Amazing. And so uh, quite a successful summer, I would say. <laughs> yes, indeed it was, especially because I uh, like handed in my thesis and then only days later there was the World Championships. And then I came back and had to defend my thesis after the World Championships. And then I went back to the next race. So it was yeah a bit crazy, but yeah, thankfully everything went well and I'm I'm very happy. This, yeah. Is that is that balance between studying a lot and sitting a lot and writing and training a good balance or is it just stress on both levels? I mean, I have to admit that in the end phase, like the last few months of the PhD, it was a bit crazy because I was basically only working and training and there was yeah not much time for anything else. Um, but in general, it I think until now it worked quite well because um, I'm allowed to do or I can work um, on a part time on a part time position, um, so that makes it easier because I actually have some time <laughs> to do my training. But then also, I mean, everyone needs some time where you can where you neither work nor train, so where you just have time to to relax. So that's quite important as well um but yeah <laughs> so that, you're still getting that kind of time <laughs> you're I filling that to. with podcast interviews <laughs> I mean yeah during the summer it's a bit tough because you're just you have also the races and a lot of training and a lot of time spending spent in the mountains um but for me that's also I mean obviously it's then training or racing but it's also it just frees my mind and I just love to do it so sometimes it feels more like a vacation <laughs> yeah. and not so much like work I mean I never I've never seen like my training or the races as work um yeah and uh, luckily my my boss is really understanding so um for example now when I come to the office I'm like hey I had this race and now 
I did well. So people want something from me. Please, can I take a few more days off? Then he's like, hey, that's no problem at all. So yeah. thankfully, it, it works out. Yeah. <laughs> And it's a little bit of a far-flung question, but perhaps that balance is also kind of nice because you don't feel the pressure of being 100% full-time athlete, right? I mean, you sort of have another world where you can go to and be someone else, which kind of breaks this up a little bit. Exactly. So a few people already asked now, are you going to do to be like now a hundred percent athlete and I'm like no definitely not I mean for once I think there is a certain risk because I mean now I'm performing well but maybe I get injured next year or something bad happens and then what do I do then so that's that's one part but the other part is just yeah to have I, I'm so glad to have something else next to the trail running I mean I love trail running but I'm especially now I'm also glad that there is like this bubble with filled with normality where people don't really know what actually happened and they can't understand because they're just not into the world of trail running and when I come back and I'm like okay I'm a perfectly normal person <laughs> are you telling I, us trail runners are normal people <laughs> <laughs> well I mean in our trail running bubble we are maybe yeah. someone else but um, it keeps me grounded uh, very much and I'm, I'm I'm so so glad to have like both of these worlds and, mm -hmm. So let's talk about your sport, your athleticism. Tell me a little bit how you kind of slid into this, because you're obviously expressing how important your studies are and your sort of work life and career. Um, where does sport come in? Because definitely, I mean, it didn't start off with the ambition to being a professional athlete, because even now that you're sort of at the cusp of being that, you don't you say you don't really want that mm -hmm. yeah I think I started quite early just doing sports but no trail running so I've been quite active throughout uh, when I was in school so first I did I think athletics when I was still in primary school and then then I actually did a few years um, I did uh, sports climbing mm -hmm. and I did a few competitions there as well but I was Actually, I was never really ambitious. <laughs> I just like to go there and I I really liked the people who were there and I enjoyed the community. But it was for me, it was not about being like a competitive athlete or something like that. Um, and then I always enjoyed uh, running. I mean, I think I started when I was around like 14 or 15. Just go out, run like 10K, come back. It always felt good. But I never had plans to do like a marathon or a half marathon even. And then I came to Switzerland and then suddenly I was in a place where there were mountains, <laughs> which uh, first of all was quite a change because where I lived before it was rather flat. Mm -hmm. And also I've never heard of trail running before. And then I think it there were just a few lucky coincidences because first of all, I couldn't really do the sports climbing because there were I didn't really know people and it was super expensive and um so I yeah was looking for something new basically and then I started running again because that was easy I only needed a pair of running shoes and then yeah. I could start and um then I went a lot to the mountains because it was summertime and somehow I think yeah just I, I just met a few people running there and I was like who what's that <laughs> and then then what happened is that then I um, did some volunteering, actually. So there, um, I don't know, actually, who told me about that, but just someone told me, hey, if you want to do something in summer, which is useful and where you get to know new people, here you can volunteer and they have different types of activities. I mean, they have trail races, but you could also volunteer at different sports events. And then I went for a few trail races, actually, and that's where I first realized what what trail running is and what trail races are mm -hmm. and i remember that actually the one of the first events where i went was the eiger ultra trail which is in switzerland and which i've run twice now and there i was volunteering and it was in the middle of the night at one of the very last eight stations i think kilometer 90 out of 100k and i was just i was so amazed by what these people are doing i was like I couldn't believe it. I thought this is incredible. And somewhere in my head, I was like, 
someday I want to do that want to do that as well or at least try it <laughs> but I would have never thought what would happen afterwards it was just like yeah I was hooked somehow yeah. mm -hmm. that is such a beautiful story of how you got into the sport that you actually sort of first saw trail running through volunteering through sitting at an aid station I think that's a really that's a really great story because it does show number one the beauty of our sport and the toughness of our sport right but it also highlights such an important part which is these races as big as you know UTMB and some of these other races are now getting they couldn't survive without volunteers they could not um, and we as runners, you know, wouldn't make it around the mountain if we wouldn't have volunteers at at all the different different spots. So that's a, that's a really cool way of getting into the sport. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I just thought about it when uh, doing UTMB. I mean, there are as many volunteers as runners. Mm -hmm. That's just a huge number of people and they are all there. Yeah, voluntarily. And it's just amazing because we need them. Otherwise, we couldn't do such a race, right? So Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's great. So you you get the idea, you are introduced to this, and then you try this out for the first time. But at this point, there is no... I mean, what I'm after is, at what point are you realizing that you're really good at that, right? <laughs> or have well, you still I'm... not realized it? <laughs> you're like, oh, this is just fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still don't see myself like as a pro runner or some, but but more and more I realize that I am good at it at least. <laughs> um, well, I mean, obviously I started with some shorter races, um, some half marathon, and then I think I did my first trail marathon like in twenty seventeen or something. And I think the first thing I realized was that I was get was better when the race was longer, mm -hmm. and I enjoyed it also more. And that's how it is today. I don't really like the fast stuff. Like a train running a train marathon as a race, it's <laughs> I don't really want to do that because I'm like, no, I want something long. It's there I can relax a bit more and there I know that I'm can excel. Um so I think the first moment where I realized, okay, maybe I'm not that bad, I guess that was when I did my first ultra, which was a I think 70k ish uh, race, and that was in 2018. And there I won it, like the female. Uh, I won won the female the the women's race, and yeah, that was a moment where I'm like, ooh, I just actually I just wanted to try an ultra, and now I'm uh, like at pole position. What happened? And then I did a few um, other ultras that year, and um, yeah, I realized okay, I. I'm actually quite good at this. <laughs> what does that... intentionally? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What what does that do to you, right? I mean, you focus on your studies. Running is supposed to be this fun side, you know, stress relief and and sport. Do you get like a voice in your head that says, "Well, maybe I need to." put all eggs in this basket and like get a coach and, and, and you go pro. I mean, do you feel, do you have this voice calling in your head or do you saying, well, if I'm already good at it without doing all of this, perhaps I'm just going to continue to do this. Yeah. So I think, I mean, the thing with the coach is that there, it, well, it was out of question because I just didn't have the money. Okay. <laughs> Because studying in Switzerland, it is super expensive and um, yeah, you barely make it each month. So it was clear to me that there was no possibility to train with a coach and that basically stayed for for like a few years. And I mean, now I'm slowly getting into a position where I could pay for a coach. Um, but now it worked for a few years and now I'm like, okay, no. I don't need a coach now. Or I I also don't know if it would work. Um, so that was the first thing. Also, I didn't know by the time that there was something like that you could do trail running as a pro athlete, that you could mm. be a pro athlete. I didn't know that that was existing. I mean, I knew that there were these races, but um, yeah, I thought, well, I 
couldn't imagine that this is a sport where you can make a living. Yeah. Living with. Um, so yeah, it, just... it speaks to the beauty of our sport that yes. we are still so new. It's still so accessible, right? That you can run, you can sign up for the races that you want and you just have a great time out there and you don't feel like there's this weird barrier between this professional world that you can't enter and the weird, you know, the amateurs, the everyman people who just sit in the back and sort of do a different sport, right? I mean, the fact that you can make it to UTMB and come in second without a coach and like a huge entourage of like support and whatever, I mean, it's incredible, right? Yeah, it is. And I think uh, I'm still a bit, I, I, yeah, surprised by myself that this is possible because obviously also in the last few years, I am ambitious. That's out of question. And I train hard and I train a lot and I prepare well. That's, um, no question about that. But still for me, it. I mean, now I, even though I'm now have a contract with sponsors and I'm a pro athlete, when you want to call it like this, um, I still, for me, the most, I mostly do it because I love it. And I just love going out to the trails and having fun. And even if you would tell me now that there are, there won't be any races anymore or I would lose my sponsorship or whatever, I still would go out and train and do all this stuff because I just love it. And it makes me so happy. And I think this is, maybe also somehow a key to the success because I never really, I mean, now maybe that changes a little bit, but I never really felt a lot of pressure. Mm. I just always, and also now at, in UTB, I stood there at the start line and I was just like, wow, I just want to go. I'm just happy to, that I know that there are now endless hours ahead of me where I just run in the mountains and do the thing I, I love the most. So that's, I think, yeah. I I love this though. This is a really cool no, this is a really cool story because I think we often try to overcomplicate and explain success by the various strategic building blocks that we put together. And I mean Courtney speaks about this in the same way, right? I mean, she says she doesn't have a coach and she goes out by feel and she runs the races every the distance that she wants to run. And it's it's almost some someone who wants to like analyze and dissect that, it's almost maddening that <laughs> you can have so much success while being so relaxed and having so much fun. And yeah. You know, let's not take away the ambition and the structure and you have to write your own training plans and you have to be focused on recovery and nutrition, right? I mean, there's a whole bunch that you put on your own shoulders. But beyond that, and I think it speaks also to the ultra distance, um, being happy goes a long way in overcoming the pain, inevitable pain, right? Exactly. And I always think, I mean... Obviously, I'm too. I'm also nervous before a race. I'm nervous as well, especially like if it's such a big race as UTMB. But I always tell myself, hey, if if I'm able to relax and to calm down and to just be there and looking forward and um, yeah, with some positive like anticipation, I know if I am able to having fun along the way and if I that everything else comes by its own so mm -hmm. and I mean I had races where I was more nervous or not so relaxed and then I realized throughout the race if I'm too nervous it doesn't work because I also then realized oh I'm not having fun now mm -hmm. and as soon as I somehow get to another like I changed my my mental approach and I was like okay just take this and imagine you are like on a training run and then the, the the fun came back and then I realized okay as soon as I am having fun and I'm happy everything else just works and um obviously yeah you have these low points in races or you have some some uh, physical problems I mean that happens and um obviously there are sometimes moments where you just can't have fun anymore <laughs> <laughs> or where it's really yeah. really hard and then um that does not help but usually for me i think it is definitely the key to try to be as relaxed as possible because i know that if i am able to enjoy it that 
that's the best way and that then I can also be successful. Yeah. So that works during the race. Let's talk a little bit about your training because in order to perform on this level, you obviously need an underlying basis of training. And if you say you don't have a coach, how do you build your training? You need to be structured. You need to be a little bit smart. You need to know when do I recover? How do you build this out? Are you super spreadsheety and build this out yourself? Or do you wake up in the morning and say, today I feel like a bike ride? <laughs> Neither the the first thing nor the second one. So, okay. um, well, I yeah, usually I mean, I have like a bigger plan for the season. So, for example, in winter, I sit down and I think, okay, which races do I want to do? And then after I've like set these major goals, then I try to um, yeah, define the different phases of training throughout winter and then the preparation phase and building phase and so on. And um, But then basically what I do is that each week um, on Sunday, I in the evening I sit down and then I do a little like write down a a little plan for the week, um, having in mind like the bigger, the bigger goals and which phase I'm in and if this is a recovery week or not, and then I have like a few, a few key workouts which I set first. So for example, one key workout would be the long run, and in winter this is like a normal long run, but in in summer then this would be like a day in the mountains. And then I have some some interval work, which is another key workout. I said this, and then then the rest somehow I fill up the week until I'm at like at maybe the the hours I want to do, or uh, yeah, included mm -hmm. all the workouts I want to do. Um, but and there is always a similar structure, but yeah, it, it changes a bit from week to week, and depending on which phase I'm in and which month we are in um yeah but i have these key workouts and other than that i try to be as flexible as possible because i know that if the plan is too strict then maybe there could be some problems particularly when you wake up you don't feel well or you start the training one but you realize something doesn't work today um i i really want to be flexible and also to be flexible enough to listen to my body and allow myself for example a, a recovery day even if it wasn't planned um yeah so there is a baseline but um i try not to be too strict um with the training. so so where do you get that knowledge from of what makes a good training week like how do you acquire that um when i started running i've you know I've, you know transcendently you're supposed to do more than just count miles but in the end you sort of you only feel like a good week is only if you break last week's mileage goal type d which is stupid and now that i have a coach i've realized how much smarter you can actually train and i never thought or would have had the confidence to say ah today i'm gonna do whatever hill workout so where do you get this information where do you get this knowledge from so I think, first of all, when I started uh, with trail running, I, at the same time, I started doing triathlon. Okay. So there it's even more complicated because you need to combine not only one discipline, but like three disciplines. And back then I've, I read a lot of books um, and watched videos and whatever. So I was really into it. And um, also I asked friends who did triathlon as well, and they had coaches and they told me, maybe try this, or I do this like this and that. So I think I asked, I've asked people, I talked with them about how they train. I've, yeah, I've read a lot. And then I think it was basically trial and error <laughs> until I arrived at a point where I'm like, okay, this seems to work. Um, because at the beginning I was running way too much and then I was injured for a long time and I realized maybe it's not good for me to run that much. And then actually I trained, and this is, also how it is today i train more like a triathlete than a tra like a trail runner or a runner per se because my mileage my weekly mileage actually i mean in summer it's something different but like in the autumn or winter or in springtime it's actually quite low or comparatively low especially for pro athletes um, but that's only because i realized okay maybe for me it's it's better to do a lot of the work um, on the bike 
And I also swim a lot and you can do there some intensity as well. You can do some endurance there, particularly on, on the bike. It's just great because you don't have all this stress, for example, on the bones mm -hmm. and you are often able to recover better. And so I realized that for me that works well and that I'm still prepared when it comes to trail races. Yeah. So I think that's also a key. And also there, just that because you need to think so much more about when do you train which discipline and which type of workout i think that's how i uh, how i've gotten to where i am today yeah yeah so how so in like the the, the training block leading up to utmb what is your weekly running mileage then Or kilometers before, before utmb or just yeah in that in the training block leading up to utmb I mean that there we are already like at the maximum mm -hmm. mileage in summer. I would say it depends. I mean, if I do it, I mean it makes a huge difference. Obviously, if I do two long days in the mountains in a week or three or four, um, but I think there the mileage maybe goes up to two hundred kilometers. Okay. Yeah, which is that, quite that a is just time. running. Which is yeah, which is running. Including trail running. I mean, there. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, yeah, but that's that's time on feet. Uh, yeah, yeah. That is feet. that is that that is long though. Even that is long, especially if you add other stuff on top of it, right? Yeah. I mean, that's yeah, a big. Is. That is big training. Then that means lots of time spent out there. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah, but that often then includes two or three whole days on the mountain, and then mm -hmm. you do like fifty or sixty k one day and suddenly you already have 25 yeah. 30 of that mileage um yeah that's true um but that that's really like the peak training phase mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. i would say that for example in, in in winter like in this typical build base building phase i usually don't do more than 100k i'm rather around 80k or something okay so, okay yeah Well, cool. Yeah, I I will make sure we link your Strava um, in the show notes because no, because it's interesting. It gives folks who are really into trail running and into running. They, I mean, I basically do nothing but running, and I don't really like it. I wish I could diversify more. But seeing your sort of training average training weeks and realizing how many different components you stack together, I think it's an it's an interesting approach and clearly it it's successful right it works and so i think it's great i believe um hannes said so too right i mean he spends a lot of time on the bike as well for an athlete sort of of his caliber it's sort of also surprising how much of his time spent is actually uh, not um, um uh, just running so that's cool so let's talk about nutrition um Again, right? You are somebody who who doesn't have like a whole team around you, and I, I'm I want to talk about the whole team and support aspect that next. But how do you approach what works for you, a eh, during training that you're fueling well enough for for your training, but then also when you go into into your races. Yeah, so I think there it also was a, a long journey. To find the products that work and that won't work um i think i had this phase where especially during the races i tried to eat as i did during the training runs which turned out that it didn't work because it was too much solid food mm -hmm. um i think i tried quite early to eat a lot of solid food because i never really liked gels um i had to force them <laughs> down <laughs> And then, but then I realized during the, the long, like the races that maybe I should try to work with gels as well. And also with, with, uh, carb drinks and everything. And, um, then I actually, I think only last year, because then I worked together with a nutritionist for a few months and we tried to optimize a lot of what I was doing. And I realized, for example, that during training, I was eaten not enough and also before and after training i completely forgot sometimes to eat <laughs> mm -hmm. um or just to think about that especially after a training session it's super important to just get like the right combination um of nutrition for recovery uh, and that was really valuable because i think before i just 
I always knew I have to eat, but I never really thought about what or when and how much. And somehow it worked, but it was never really good. And I think now this year I realized that my strategy is still not perfect, but it works. And I try to do now basically like a 50-50 thing that I try to cover roughly 50% with, with, with drinks um, because that's the easiest and then the other 50% is gels and solid food. Mm. And that seems to work quite well. But I think, yeah, just the most important rule, and I also, I think that's true for races, is whatever you can eat, eat it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because in the end, you are running in such a deficit. And um, as long as you can keep it down, it's just, yeah, eat yeah. what you like. And that's also what I tell, my, tell myself. I usually have... Um, when I come to an aid station, I'm like, okay, what what do I want to eat now? What what looks the best, or what what looks actually eatable? <laughs> and then yeah. I eat that. And, um, yeah. So for so for UTMB, you went up to the buffet and figured out what you wanted, or did you have somebody there? I mean, you know, we as spectators and bystanders we see the pro athletes arrive at Comayeur and their tables are set up with like 15 different items and so I, where where did you, did you have like uh, your personal buffet set up by your support or did you go and said uh, like some cut cheese please <laughs> <laughs> no I had a crew which was really really cool to have and I had um I gave them many different food items because i was not sure beforehand and i just thought okay give them a variety of food and then hopefully something is there which i want to eat <laughs> and um luckily it, it worked like that so most of the food i was like what was i thinking <laughs> i really don't want to eat this now but i had a few items um wh which worked and where i was like okay i'm glad i packed this these things but then you always have these eight stations in between where you don't have your crew so there it was really like okay what what looks good what appears to me right now it's like yeah mm -hmm. just <laughs> shove this. anything in your face and go yeah 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 in the hope that i don't have to throw it up so <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so <laughs> let's talk a little bit about crew and support the level that you're running at both from during training from a training partners, but then also during the races, increasingly, I don't know, we, we go out running sometimes to be alone by ourselves. But at the level that you're running, if you have a casual long run, your average friends can't really follow you anymore, right? Where do you find sort of both the, the physical support of like, I need somebody who can really help me um, so I'm not alone for, you know, 50 kilometers through the mountains. And then also sort of that emotional support of like, I'm now running on a level that nobody really quite understands. You know, we've I've talked to people where for a while their parents were their aid station crew, but their parents don't understand trail running, right? And then you get in and you look completely destroyed, right? And your mom wants to say nothing against parents. Obviously they love each other. Uh, they love us, right? But they, they don't have the right kind of approach. Like if my mom would show up at an aid station to help me, I think it would actually not help, right? <laughs> she would yeah. give me that look of like, you can't continue. You look terrible, right? That's not the support that we need. So where do you find your support yeah so actually i have to admit that being supported is also something new for me because i did many of my races unsupported and actually i think the first race where i was supported was last year and um so i'm actually used to deal with everything on my own um so for example when i did tds last year that was quite quite an experience because there is only one drop back in these like 20 more than 20 hours of, of racing and um but i realized okay hey i can do this so i yeah i know how to do it on my own and then so it was actually it was for me also a step to to actually receive support from friends um because then i had to told, tell them before hey guys it could be that i am there and i'm not feeling well or that I maybe don't want to continue or that I'm in doubt and please don't 
let me quit at the aid station yes. don't encourage me you know as it will be better so i mean um also the the friends who supported me now during UTMB, they are athletes by themselves they are not pro athletes but they are athletes as well so they know how it feels to do like a long distance trail run or triathlon um so that is really important for me because they 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 yeah they are just they know this experience and they also know that you can be in so much trouble but it, that it can get better and so i i yeah i think that's actually the best type of support you can have someone who can really feel you in that situation but also someone who knows hey just go on and we'll get better or we know you you will be better soon and who encourages you instead of like ah better you should stop now okay. <laughs> um yeah so i think that that worked really well now for the last few races um yeah it's the cool. best way of and and for a an event like utmb where it's not just the on support on race support but the entire sort of week leading up to it are you able to are you, or do you have to navigate this all by yourself or do you have sort of a support from some of your sponsors or from other people like how do you find you know i'm seeing marcel with adidas terex right they have a house together and they're like all working is that something that you have some people that you can sort of partner with as you are trying to navigate the because i mean figuring out utmb is is a huge challenge before you even step your feet onto the trail right so how do you navigate that all of that i mean obviously preparing for the race the preparation i did all on my own but yeah. what was really great this year is that yeah since january i have a contract with hoka and so it was the first time that I was there as a sponsored athlete and not like on my own, like last year. And um, they supported us in a great way. So we also, during the week, we had uh, some chalets for the athletes where we would stay together in the same house with like a group of other hookah athletes. And that was really cool for support just to know, okay, they also have a race, maybe they have a diff different race. Um, but they're also here and preparing and they're also maybe a bit nervous or excited and just to be there and um, to chat with them and yeah not being on your own totally that helped me so much because somehow it really calmed me down a lot <laughs> just to know hey we are all in this boat now and everybody's somehow excited but it was so much like positive energy and not yourself on your own being nervous <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, it's yeah. good to it's good to hear that you were able to draw some positivity out of that, and it was really helpful because it also could add to the craziness, right? If you sort of say in a chalet where it's like five other athletes and everybody is freaking out and nervous, you're like, no, I need my peace and calm. So it's good to hear that this actually helped you. No, definitely. I mean, I mean, I would have had. I mean, I had a room for myself, so there was enough space to retreat if I felt like, oh, it's too much now. But in general, for me, it helped because there were also a couple of athletes in my chalet that were that are way more experienced. And that, I mean, they were just super relaxed. <laughs> yeah. So, for example, one of the athletes was Ludo Pomeray, who just did an amazing fifth place yeah. and he's almost 50 years old. So that's just mind-blowing and he was there and he also was yeah, running UTMB and he was like so relaxed and chilled all the time and so that that helped just a lot to see hey we 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 are all here and we can talk about it but it's just in the end it's just a race mm -hmm. like any other race <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. well that's awesome let's talk about your race um yeah let's talk about this what we actually came here for I felt like that was a, a good long winding up to it and we've kept uh, listeners <laughs> now i mean the the thing that strikes me the most when following <laughs> and i think every and i don't know if that works because i live on the west coast of the u.s so i wake 
you know, I, I watched the start of the race live and then I go, you know, and on whatever my Friday night or so. Right. And then, or then I go to sleep and then I wake up and then Saturday morning, it's supposed to be my long run. And I missed the finish of the men's because I didn't wake up in time. But then I watched um, the women's race finish and it gave me enough motivation to go out on my run, which was fantastic. But I kept in the back of the mind that it's like, if I would run UTMB, I would be out there for probably another like 20 hours longer. <laughs> so <laughs> what your what your race is, is so much faster and so much more intense, but then also shorter. So it's such a different, different story because you see different parts of the course at different times of the day, right? So... Are you crazy um, starting off out of the gate? Are you running at like six minute miles or do you let all the crazies go first? Where do you find yourself in the starting corral? Well, I I try to not be there in the first row and also not in the second row. <laughs> I think I started somewhere in like seventh row or something because I knew that they would like run super hard from the gun and I hate this usually everyone hates it that's the funny part oh, okay. every person you talk to says i and absolutely hate it. and everybody does it <laughs> you should like I talk to each other you should say guys slow the fuck down <laughs> but there will always be someone who won't so it's yes just ridiculous actually and it actually doesn't help that the first like eight kilometers are mostly flat yeah yeah it doesn't help at all so i really i mean yeah obviously i ran maybe a bit too fast for what i wanted but i still hold myself back because i was like guys you go ahead we catch up later mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was good because i met actually a friend she was also running and um we i met her like on like after three or four k and then we chatted a bit and that helped to also not run too fast and we are both we were both like laughing about how fast everybody is going and how we want to keep it a bit more relaxed and that helped a lot uh, just to not go f crazy um but then luckily i mean after the f i think when the first climb arrived that already the pace was 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 okay and um, i had the feeling okay now i can do my own thing and yeah yeah but at like the beginning the first 2k i mean what even adds to the madness is that the, the, the streets are just full and people are like screaming at you and you feel like okay uh my they scream at you as if you are on the last 2k and not on the first 2k and you're like hey calm down we have so much uh to run ahead uh, like so many kilometers ahead of us and yeah it's just crazy <laughs> When when you when you're standing there in that starting corral, is that what's the feeling? Is it nervousness? Is it? I mean, watching it on TV, it feels very emotional, right? When they start playing Conquest of Paradise, right? It's like, oh my gosh, I like it's yeah. it's. Do you feel that too, or are you just focused on? Oh my gosh, make I I hope my headlamp isn't on in the back and i hope i have my nutrition packed are you fully dialed and focused are you panicky where you where you at in that moment no i don't know why but usually and it wasn't different for utmb as soon as i'm finally standing there i calmed down so much i was just i couldn't believe that i was standing there i was just so happy and obviously a bit emotional but i was just full of anticipation and yeah i was just like ah oh, finally this long week is finally done and finally right here and finally we can start because i thought okay now it's easy I mean, now we only have to run right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and before you think overthink all everything and and then i was just like okay now i'm glad we are here and i was just super happy yeah how many so days cool. before the race did you arrive in germany Oh, this time it was uh, quite uh, many days. So I arrived actually on Sunday before. Okay. Which is a lot. So like five days before the start. Yeah, usually I only arrive like two days before when I go to races. But this time I had some obligations also with my sponsor. And I just, 
it was good because it gave me some time to settle and prepare and just chill. Yeah, good. that was good. All right, so you you head into the first night. Um, I mean, everybody always says it, it sounds like the right strategy, but it's still time on feet. Everybody says this, the race doesn't start on real comer year, but <laughs> you still have to you still have to make your find a way of getting there. <laughs> so I don't know if that's a fair assessment. How do you let's talk about the first half of the race that the one that no <laughs> the part that no one talks about. <laughs> yeah i mean actually it's true because also many people like they go out like crazy and then they drop in coma year so yeah it's it, i think it's really true that the race only starts there and then you know for us pro athletes it's only getting light afterwards so it's mm-hmm. still dark when we reach coma year so mm-hmm. yeah the first half i mean i mean the first half of the first half so the first quarter of the race it is actually like madness because there are still so many people out there cheering. I mean, when you come to saint Java, which is kilometer 21, so the first half marathon, it's it's ridiculous. The streets, they were crowded. There were so many people. It was so loud. I was like, what is going on? I had like goosebumps all over for 10 minutes. I don't know. It was crazy. And then even when the night... Uh, when it's getting dark then there are still so many people cheering you and actually I was quite glad that when we reached like kilometer 40 or something when there was this first longer ascent then finally it calmed down because that is then also the moment where I'm finally okay now I can concentrate on my pace on my race Um, I mean I love the crowds it was amazing because this is special this is just UTMB um, but then I was also glad when we headed into the night and they're like, okay, finally, everything is settling down. People are like, okay, now we, we, we sort everything. And yeah, I was just, just happy to, to reach then the night. Yeah. I mean, on one side, it's unique for trail running. And so you, you have to embrace it. Right. But on the other side, it could also be distracting and if it's distracting in a bad way, then you could lose your race, right? If you're so distracted by the crowds, you could potentially forget to eat or whatever, right? But it could also be distracting, especially because it's early on in the race, that you're really just like floating and you're taking it all in and you don't really worry about what you're doing because you have so many kilometers to go. You might as well not think about what you're doing for a few hours, right? Absolutely. And I think the first 40k, they they flew by mm-hmm. like nothing. Um, you were like carried <laughs> yeah. along by the people. Um, yeah, so I, I really like that. And I tried to soak it up as much as possible because I knew that the night would be super long and that there would be fewer and fewer people. Um, yeah, but in the end, I liked both. I really liked this atmosphere, but then I also really liked like the silence um and being on the mountain only with the other runners um, yeah it must it must feel like a nice break right when you all of a sudden yeah you can actually hear your own breathing again (laughs) do you at what point in the race do you start paying attention to your competition like for how long do you sort of are just in it managing yourself and saying okay this is just my loop around the mountain and i want to make sure that the system works and i'm not screwing anything up and at one point you're like try to figure out where where am i actually in in the women's field or in the general field yeah so for me that was only after 100k roughly Mm -hmm. Um, also because I first of all I mean I know that especially in these long races it's just the most important thing to race your own race mm-hmm. from the beginning and um, I I mean I had a goal time in mind from the beginning and I was like okay if I can follow the plan if I can tick the boxes if I can just yeah pace myself well and if I can reach this time then I already knew that I would be in a good position in the end Mm -hmm. even without like racing um and then at kilometer 80 like at Comayor I struggled a bit because I had some bad pain in my knee something like a runner's knee and I actually at that point I was not able if I could finish it all and then 
competition was not there in my mind. I was just like, okay, I just want to finish. I, I don't care mm-hmm. what happens. I just want that this improves such that they can finish. And then only at kilometer 100, when I realized, okay, the knee's getting better. And also it got light then. Um, and then I met my teammate, um, one, one of the French girls. And um, she told me then that she was at fourth position at the point. And then I only realized, oh, I'm, I'm not that bad position. And but then she had to drop because she had a fall and it was really bad. And then I knew, OK, I'm now in fourth position. And then I was like, wow, if I just can keep going and bring that fourth place uh, into Chamonix, I mean, that would be like the best fourth place ever, right? Yeah. <laughs> That was my mind. And I was actually more orientated to the runners behind me because I was like, ah, oh, I mean, okay, if even if someone overtakes me and I'm still fifth, I was just really happy with this. And I said, okay, let's let's uh, try to not getting be, being catched <laughs> by mm-hmm. the runners behind me. But I, I actually, I wasn't interested in how far away the others were before me because I knew it's still 70k to go. It's such a long way. Everything can happen. And I think only when I came to Champilac, which is already close to kilometer 130, then people started telling me, hey, second and third place, they are not far ahead. They're actually within the next 10 minutes. And I think that's when I realized, okay, it seems that I am catching up with them instead of that people behind are catching up with me. Mm-hmm. So that uh, gave me the feeling, okay, maybe I just continue. I didn't already was in race mode then but i just thought okay if i continue like this then eventually i will catch up because it was still more than 40k to go so just a few hours and um that then i continued and it it was so um first i catched up with blondine who ended up being third and she was also in third position then then i catched her and then i was like suddenly wow now i'm in third position that's that's crazy um but i i think that was actually when when i overtook her that was the first moment when i'm like okay let's let's race this i have actually the opportunity to get on the on that podium so i still felt good so i was like okay let's try try this and then also when i had the chance to overtake second place i was like okay i still feel good it was on an uphill section i know that that's my strength and i was like pushing maybe a bit more than I would have only with my time goal in mind. But at that moment, I realized, okay, now it's really a race. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and as soon as I've overtaken her, I tried to push even more to just open a gap. And I think only in the end, then I realized, like on the last climb, I realized, okay, maybe I've pushed a bit too hard because that was not my plan from the beginning. Um, but then at the same time, I really was then in that race mode. I'm like, okay, now I really want that podium. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, I think the race only started for me on the last forty k, and before it was only conserve everything and trying to get there in one piece. Yeah, yeah. You you talk about it so um, reserved. Were you ever thinking about Courtney? Was she so far ahead? You were like, she is in a different universe. I mean, what I didn't know was that she would ha- was having a bad day by herself. Um, I mean, still, it's she still won, so it's incredible what she did. But I think, and she told me after the race that she suffered quite a lot. And I think I even made up quite some time on her. In the end, it was only 40 minutes. And I think in between, it was like 90 minutes that she was ahead of me. Um, but no, I was never thinking about Courtney I mean also in my head it was it was never the question who was in first place because when they told me that second and third place are close ahead I I did not know which which who it actually yeah yeah who it actually was but in my mind there was no doubt that Courtney was in this first position Mm -hmm. that was never a doubt and I mean I also was just happy for her that she that she won because what she did is also just incredible and i mean people i mean it it must be so much harder when people already expect you to win i mean there was no question right that she would win um but and still but still she had such a tough race and uh, yeah it's just it's just incredible but i never thought about her no 
Yeah. There there was one moment on the live stream where you were moving really fast and fluid and Courtney was going down this really technical section and she was really struggling. I actually could really relate to her, which I thought was really great because I've been in these last sections of races where not, where your body doesn't work and you have to like navigate a technique. And you're like, if I don't have poles, I'm just going to fall down the hill. And it felt like they were watching her. I was like, oh, look, that's a, that's how I feel going down these sections. It felt very yeah. relatable. But it was this yeah. one moment. I would obviously you ran out of time, right? I mean, to, um, she was too too far ahead, right? But it's also what's more important very beautiful for you the way you express your um respect and understanding for her and her achievement that you can take what you are having i don't know i think that's partially ultra running it's partially you as women runners you have a different way of competing you are not so um competitive if you will but the way you sort of express what she was doing out there after the summer and understanding sort of the pressure that she was under is is, is incredible to hear because we often especially in the media right we are trying to make the sport all about competition and fight against each other and sort of this this energy that we draw from from wanting to compete and it's really not about that at all right no it's not and i'm so glad it's not um i mean i think i realized that for the first time in the world championship race because there i had actually the situation that i um was for part of the race i was a race leader and i over when i overtook the first first women we were on the live stream and i just i chatted with her for like five minutes and people were going crazy they were like what's going on? They are chatting, but this is a serious race. It's the World Championships. And afterwards, I was like, no, it's not. I mean, it is the World Championships, yes. But isn't that the beauty of our sport that we are just like friendly competitive? I mean, in the end, it was a tough competition and everybody fought for positions. But still, we have, I mean, we are out there for so long. And I mean, we were walking uphill. I mean, I couldn't even go that much faster. So I was like, why don't chat a bit to her? And I, I was interested in how she's doing and, and if she had problems or whatever. And it's just great to see that we have this competition and everybody is ambitious and obviously wants to do well. But in the end, also now at UTMB, we are at the finish line and we are just so happy for us, obviously, but also for the others. And I love that because for me, it's that's where we are again back to this the fun part. In the end, it's all about fun having fun right and having a good time and for me also this community is just so special um and yeah it would be actually quite sad if we would be there at the finish line and everybody's like huh she beat me now and okay next time maybe i do better no because i think especially with these really long races i mean we know how tough is how tough it is out there and how much everybody invests already beforehand and how much also, this is just a part of our daily life and our identity. It's so much more than just like, yeah, I don't want to compare it with another sport now. But I think, it, yeah, it's just so special because you just can't go there like, okay, I want to win. It's it's so much more. And we all know that we everyone suffers throughout this race. And in the end, I think, yeah, it's nice to be up there at the top and to be on the podium. But I'm just happy for everybody who finishes and who had a, has a great time. And yeah, it's just great to see that even now that I'm like running or finishing together with pro athletes and not with like the slower runners anymore, that those people are still like the same. They just enjoy it being there. And yeah, I think that's so beautiful. And I hope that it will stay like this for a long, long time, actually. Yeah. No, it is an interesting challenge that I think we in the media are probably mostly responsible for because we're the ones who are trying to manufacture these stories. Yeah, we are trying to manufacture competition and animosity and we're, we're trying to come up with sort of a, a storyline that is more than it's there because I think especially in ultra running, 
Number one, it's a new sport and it's not as manufactured yet. It's not as controlled yet, but it's also so incredibly hard. There is so much that is demanded of an individual. And so I think it's hard. I mean, even the top runners can't, I mean, it was a period, perhaps 10, 15, 20 years ago, when runners could win Western States seven times in a row or something like that, right? But I mean, nowadays, people can't keep up those performances, except Courtney, on, <laughs> on this insane level forever, right? But even she struggles, right? And she, even she, you know, it struggled at Hard Rock and at other races. So it's not like you can just show up and... And it's not about being superhuman, but having this manufactured team around you that sort of tries to get you to this to this place, right? And so I think that we need to preserve that and we need to take it back. And in some respects, it's good that UTMB is still in the hands of the Pilates because their dream has always been about that personal adventure, that personal story that you find as you're running around Mont Blanc, right? As much as they are producing this event now into this global spectacle in many ways they're still there to celebrate every runner who toes the line and makes it back to Chamonix right right yeah and I think that's also an important aspect to me um often people talk to me after the race and they finished like way after after I finished and then they say hey but it's this is strange you are just talking to us like you are one of us and I'm like I am one of you. I mean, I am, we are all in this together and I'm not someone different just because I'm faster or because I'm having, I'm having a contract. It's just, uh, and also I tell them, Hey, when they tell me, Hey, you inspire me. I'm like, Hey, but you inspire me as well because I actually could never imagine like running around uh, Mont Blanc and being out there for 48 hours. <laughs> That's such a long time and th still those people, they finish and they finish with a smile and that's just something, something else. But in the end, they have this, they did the same course and they are ending there and I'm like, hey, I, I am inspired by you as much as you are by me. So that's, that's, I mean, yeah, I think that's, that's how it is. And it's so nice to see now that I also get to know the other pro athletes that most of them are, are the same and they're just like, hey, it's, we are all here together and obviously some are faster and some are slower, but in the end, it's just, we are here and we are having fun. And yeah, I think yeah. that's just an important aspect also that to, to, to stay grounded. I mean, that's also what I admire about Courtney, that she's just, she's such a like normal human mm. being. She's not like, Oh, I'm something better now because I win all these races. I mean, that's, that has been the beauty of our sport and in many ways, I think what has been guiding us that are sort of our inspirational figures, Killian too is very grounded and very humble in many ways. And he is, you know, the ultimate superstar. And, and I think as long as we have runners that are sort of our role models um, at the top who still embody the enjoyment of running and actually the love for the mountains more so than the love for the shiny competition, I think our sport will stay in the right place and will continue to reflect the right values that we all decided why we want to be in this sport for, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that also this helps to like keep, the joy or the the fun of it like as the most important aspect mm -hmm. and not like about only winning races or being super competition competitive i think there is already enough competition we don't need to be more competitive because we are a competitive af <laughs> mm -hmm. but at the same time at the same time it's still yeah there's still this this other aspect and i think yeah it it helps our sport so much and I just I just hope I just hope that it's like it's not like commercialized too much and that we are not in the end having a sport which is maybe Olympic but then loses this important aspect and where we then really have a separation between elite athletes and people who just do it because 
yeah. and, and don't win races and but yeah. You know. Well, I mean, in many ways, if at the greatest stage of our sport, UTMB, or even the World Championship, where you also came in in second, if a runner like you who does it for the love of the sport and doesn't buy herself through sponsor money or whatever, sort of this weird manufactured sort of training cycle, right? You're not running with a special shoe. You're not running with your own nutrition mix, right? I mean, there's sort of this formula one idea, right? Where the, yeah, you're the race car driver, but you have a crew of 50 people around you who sort of propel you to, to this place, right? As long as you can still perform on the highest level, then our sport is in a good place because manufacturing won't compete with that, right? If the sheer joy of running beats the manufactured efforts, then the, then we win, right? Because then, if if you have fun, but you have you realize I have no chance anymore, right? The way sort of I don't know thirty years ago during the Tour de France when everybody was doping, right, and was sort of the, the normal cyclist sort of didn't have a chance anymore, right? There is sort of this feeling of deflation of like I just want to have fun, right? But as long as we can still have fun and be at the highest level, then our sport is safe. I hope so, yeah. <laughs> I I think we really can only hope that and also that I mean it's in the end it's the people doing the sport that somehow also decide in which direction it's mm -hmm. getting pushed. I mean obviously it's also what's coming from from outside and from sponsors and media and whatever. But in the end if we as the athletes also say no we we don't like that we want to keep it as it is then i hope very much that it will stay as it is and also i give my best then when when i do interviews or podcasts like with you right now i just try my best to to transport this that this is really important to me or the most important aspect is to me um not being a like olympic medal winner but to just continue this sport as it is now where we have a lovely community and where we all are somehow in a race together the the elite athletes and the, the more like normal athletes um yeah that's because i just think that's really unique yeah in our sport no fantastic i think there's no better way of finishing this off i kept you long enough katarina thank you so much before i let you go um tell listeners how they can reach out to you where they can connect with you you have an incredible instagram handle which i think connects to <laughs> your other big love and passion which is actually your work because it has nothing to do with running yes it has actually more to do with science yeah that's true um, yeah, and people already said like, hey, you should change this now. And I'm like, no, why should I change this? It's like, <laughs> um, yeah, so I think people can find me the best via Instagram. And my handle is Galileo1307. But if that's too difficult, then you kind of just Google my name and it will be like the first thing <laughs> that's popping up. It's my Instagram. Um, I'm still also on Facebook, but that's basically I just copy what I write on Instagram. So nothing new there. And also people can follow me on Strava and there it's just my normal name and you can find me there. Perfect. We'll link all of these things in the show notes. Katharina, thank you so much for this incredible conversation, for sort of bringing your, your insight and your stories to the podcast. I wish you all the best. We didn't even talk about your off season. Are you going to get a break are you going to be able to relax a little bit? Is Was UTMB the pinnacle or do you have any other races on your calendar? Um, I don't know right now. I th Yeah, I think maybe something for fun. <laughs> I mean, there, will, there won't be something super competitive. Um, I will definitely take an off season, uh, but not yet because the weather is just too nice here in Switzerland. So... <laughs> Let's see a few more adventures, but maybe more on my own than than in a race format in the next few weeks, and then a nice off season, and then let's see what happens next year. And fantastic! We won't ask any further. Um, wishing you uh, some incredible days in the mountains, Katarina. Thank you so much for coming on Single Track. Thanks for having me. 